Welcome to the DaVinci Academy Histology video course. The entire video course is available on YouTube and covers all of the fundamental principles of histology and relevant cell biology. You can find all of the videos from the course by clicking the histology playlist link in the description below, and then you can access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos by going to our website, which is also linked in the description below. All right, so in this lecture, we're gonna be covering the major eukaryotic organelles. So we've covered the nucleus. Now we'll go through some of the other major organelles within the eukaryotic cell. A lot of this will be review from your undergraduate biology courses, but it's good to have this basic knowledge solidified and then also see how it applies to histology. So first we have the endoplasmic reticulum or the ER. It's composed of two separate membrane bound structures or membrane bound organelles, the rough ER or RER, and then the smooth ER or the SER. And so and you'll see why they're named that in a second. So if we look at here, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it's usually adjacent to and often continuous with the membrane of the nucleus. And then you have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum here. So the reason it's called rough is because you see these black dots here. These are actually ribosomes embedded within the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes are involved in translation of RNA into amino acids, which eventually become proteins. And the ribosomes located within the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum are actually involved in secretory proteins, proteins that are either going to be secreted out of the cell or proteins that are going to be embedded into the cell membrane itself. And so again, the reason for the name is it kind of has this rough appearance with these ribosomes. And you'll see that on electron microscopy in a second here. Smooth ER has different functions and then visually it doesn't have these ribosomes so it looks much more smooth on electron microscopy. So again like I said ribosomes they function to translate RNA into amino acid chains that form both cytosolic and organelle proteins. So again you remember kind of the central dogma of biology DNA is transcribed into RNA and then RNA is translated into polypeptides and then polypeptides form proteins. So this portion right here is carried out by the ribosome. And as you can see, there's ribosomes that are floating freely within the cytosol, and those will synthesize proteins that are gonna be active within the cell. And then you also, like we mentioned on the previous slide, you have these ribosomes that are embedded within the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They're involved in synthesizing both membrane-bound proteins and then secretory proteins. So again, here's that same electron microscopy section we looked at earlier. Here's the nucleus, like we pointed out. And then if you look at here, these kind of squiggly lines like this, just adjacent to the nuclear membrane here, this is actually your rough endoplasmic reticulum. And so if we zoom in here, so again, here's the nucleus here. And then if we look at these squiggly lines here, this is all and over here as well and over here, this is all your rough endoplasmic reticulum. And if you look at closely here, just above this red line, you can see these dots here, these black circles, and it's kind of, you know, almost studded appearance across these lines here. And these are the ribosomes. And so these ribosomes are these black dots that appear on the membrane surface of the endoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And so it has this kind of bumpy or rough appearance to it, and that's why it's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And again, like we've said, the rough endoplasmic reticulum as a whole is responsible for translation and folding of secretory proteins. So the proteins are synthesized or translated by the ribosomes, but then within the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they undergo further folding and processing. They also synthesize membrane-bound proteins and end-linked oligosaccharide additions to many different proteins. Cells that are responsible for secreting large amounts of proteins have large amounts of rough ER. That's, you know, it corresponds to the cellular function, the amount of rough ER present within the cell. And examples of this are mucus secreting goblet cells, which are found in the respiratory and intestinal tracts. We'll talk about more about that in those respective lectures. Also plasma cells, which are responsible for secreting antibodies. Antibodies are a type of protein, so it makes sense that plasma cells would have a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum. These are common histology test questions and even they can show up on your board exams, on the USMLE exams, because it makes you tie together both the overall function of the cell and then the function of the organelles and kind of the relative concentration of those organelles within the cell. 
And then Nissl bodies, these are granular bodies of rough ER found in neurons. So they're specific to neurons and they're responsible for synthesizing peptide neurotransmitters. So that makes sense. Again, responsible for synthesizing peptides that are going to be secreted out of the cell. And we'll talk about these in more detail in the nervous system lecture. So here's a light microscopy section. This is an H and E stain. And this is from the exocrine pancreas. And so, you know, the EM section we looked at previously was from the exocrine pancreas. Here's a light microscopy section. And this is displaying what's also known as cytoplasmic basophilia. So if we look at the cell right here, let's say this one right here, if you can see, here's the nucleus right here. And then as you, if you notice at the bottoms of these cells or the basal aspect of these cells, it's very purple. It's much more darker purple than up here where it's lighter, more pinkish. And the reason for this more darker purplish appearance is this is what's called cytoplasmic basophilia. And it's at the base of the cells and it's due to the high concentrations of ribosomes located in the rough ER. So the exocrine pancreas cells, these are responsible for secreting digestive enzymes, which are proteins. And so at the base of their cells, they're gonna have a high concentration of rough ER, which has a high concentration of ribosomes. And so as a result of that high concentration of ribosomes, just like we show here and here and here, you're gonna see a high concentration of basophilia or cytoplasmic basophilia at the base of the cells. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the major functions are synthesis of lipids and steroids, and then detoxification of drugs and poisons. They lack those surface ribosomes, so visually that's again why they're called smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The following cells, again paying attention to which cells are rich in certain types of organelles. So these cells are rich in smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which correlates to the overall function of these cells. So hepatocytes, which are liver cells, they have high concentrations of SER because one of their main functions is to detoxify drugs and poisons that are ingested into the body. Cells of the adrenal cortex, which is an organ located above the kidney and responsible for synthesizing steroid hormones, they are also gonna have a high concentration of smooth endoplasmic reticulum because smooth endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for synthesizing steroids. So the Golgi apparatus, which you'll see right here, kind of has this stacked pancake look to it. And we'll show this again on the EM slide on the next slide. It's usually adjacent to the rough endoplasmic reticulum because it receives newly synthesized proteins from the ER, both the rough ER and the smooth ER. And it's kind of like a it's almost like your FedEx center or your UPS center. It, it receives packages, processes them, and then sends them out. And so it sorts and packages these different lipids and proteins into vesicles that can either travel to the surface of the cell and fuse with the membrane and actually even be excreted out or embedded into the membrane. Or you can have vesicles that then travel within the cell for intracellular functions. So this is a electron micrograph of a macrophage, which is an immune cell. And so you can see it here. Here's your Golgi apparatus. It's a good picture of it, like right here. And as you can see, it has this very kind of pancake stacked appearance. So you see these long tube-like structures like this, and you can see they're continually stacked on each other like that. And so this is, again, the appearance you're going to be looking for, the pattern you're going to be looking for on electron microscopy. So the mitochondria, these are the site of oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP within the cell. So these are the energy centers of the cell. So here's a mitochondria. They have kind of these elongated shape like this. They have two separate membranes, the inner and outer membrane. And you can see that here, and they have a lot of these folds called cristae, invaginate, which within the, the organelle itself. And so if you remember, glucose is broken down to pyruvate via glycolysis. And then pyruvate can go one of two ways. It can either go towards lactate, and this just relies on the two ATP, the two net ATP that are produced by glycolysis, and this is what's called anaerobic respiration. Pyruvate can then also be converted into acetyl-CoA within the mitochondria, and then acetyl-CoA can then enter into the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle, which then produces NADH and FADH2, 
which then go on to the electron transport chain to produce ATP. This is a very simplistic diagram, but it's just to kind of illustrate the major lead concepts. And so again, this is what's called oxidative phosphorylation because it couples oxidation of these electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, to phosphorylation of ADP to produce ATP. So that's where the name oxidative phosphorylation comes from. And this is what's called aerobic respiration. And so this is what occurs within the mitochondria. There's other functions that occur in the mitochondria, but these are the major functions. So again, here's our electron micrograph. This is the same one we've been looking at before and some of the other slides. Here's your nucleus. Here's your Golgi over here. These are vesicles over here. In the case of pancreatic acinar cells, these would actually be carrying zymogens, which are precursors to digestive enzymes. We'll talk more about that in the GI lectures. But here's a good example of a mitochondria right here. You can see it elongated. You can see these double membrane folds within, this, within the organelle here. Here's another view of it like this. So again, you can see the two membranes like this. You can see them coming into the organelle like this. This is kind of a longitudinal view. And then on this view, this is more of a cross-section view. So you want to be aware of both of these images because you could see either one of them on an exam. You could see a longitudinal view or you could see a cross-section. So don't be thrown off if you see either one of these on an exam. And again, you see the same kind of thing. You see these double membranes. You see invagination of these folds within to the organelle. Same kind of look, just a different way, just a different view or a different cut. Then you have lysosomes, which we show here. And these are vesicles that contain hydrolytic enzymes. And what hydrolytic enzymes do is they break down a variety of molecules within the cell, so including peptides, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids. They're essentially the garbage disposal of the cell. So you have cellular garbage or cellular debris floating around in the cell, and those get broken down further by the lysosomes. Peroxisomes, these protect cells from reactive oxygen species. So these right here. These are a big cause of inflammation and damage within the cell, so it's important to control reactive oxygen species, and peroxisomes play a crucial role in that. They're also responsible for breakdown of very long-chain fatty acids via beta-oxidation, breakdown of branch-chain fatty acids, amino acids, and ethanol. So the proteasome, this is a protein complex responsible for degrading damaged proteins or proteins tagged with ubiquitin. So if you have a protein like this, and it gets ubiquitinated, so it has ubiquitin added to it, we'll just represent that with you, it's kind of a tag or a signal to the proteasome that the proteasome knows to come over and degrade it. And so what happens is you have either a damaged protein or a protein that's been around too long, and it gets ubiquitinated, and that tags it for the proteasome to degrade it. Because remember, proteins are cyclical. You know, they have a lifespan. It's eventually renew new proteins within the cell. It's the same thing like a car. The great analogy is, you know, eventually you're going to need new tires. You need an oil change. You know, you need other new engine parts. And so it's the same thing within a cell. You're going to need new proteins. And so that's just part of the cyclical process. Where that comes into play in pathology is if you have defects in a proteasome, this has been found to be involved in certain cancers, and this makes sense. If this is a protein that drives DNA replication or cellular division, and it's not getting degraded, and it's just running amok, it's going to cause uncontrolled cellular division, and that's how you get cancer. It's also been involved in some cases of Parkinson's disease as well. Thank you for watching this video from the Da Vinci Academy Histology video course, which is completely available on YouTube. To access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos, go to our website using the link in the description below.